I'm just How's making it hanging? Sure it's going well, man. Thanks for doing this. I know you, uh, it's late in the fatherhood business. So, uh, I'm I've- so tired. <laughs> <laughs> like my son woke up at like eight 30, like he went to bed at like seven and it's like eight 30 and I'm like, just get back to bed by like eight 45. So I could just go like, all right, let's do this. You know? And he did, he was good. So I've been up since like six o'clock. So I'm just like, Oh, you're the constant, uh, you're the constant hustler, man. Like that's one thing that I've, I've respected about you a ton since I've known you. And just over the years, like kind of keeping up with everything you do on social media, Mm -hmm. that you're constantly, you're basically always doing something and you're always. (laughs) I kind of have to, you know, so it just is always like not not baffled is is the wrong word it'd be more like i've been motivated by seeing that happen because a lot of times yeah. you see like things start or people will talk about like oh i'm doing this big thing and then it like peters off you know somehow uh energy wise so that's one of mm-hmm. the reasons why i wanted to to have you on because that's something that i'm always um kind of the the longevity of someone in any form of the arts yeah how they how they pursue that so um awesome i tried to put together a little uh nice little intro for you so let me go do that for the for the listeners here uh patrick jr is a full-time lecturer of english and assistant director of the journalism program at kingsborough community college the chairman of city uh the chairman of City University of New York Journalism Discipline Council, and is the founder and editor-in-chief of ReviewFix.com. He's also a former news editor at NBC Local Integrated Media and national video games writer at Examiner.com, where his work was mentioned in national ad campaigns by Disney, Nintendo, and EA Sports. Most recently, he's the author of the widely successful book series, The Minds Behind the Games, and is the writer of the comic book Condry, published by Lesser Known Comics. Patrick Hickey Jr., welcome to the Artist Dojo. Can't believe I'm here. Thank you so much for having <laughs> me. It means a lot. Yeah, dude. No, it's uh, it's fun because we've known each other for a long time. And the the funny thing about um, I think social media is that you get to kind of peek into people's lives. So even though we mm-hmm. ourselves actually never hung out a ton we went to high school together. Yeah. So that's kind of crazy. A lot of people don't know that we went to William E. Grady high school in Brooklyn, New York. No lady Grady. No Mm -hmm. lady Grady. I don't know. Do Mm -hmm. they still call the the lunch skills there? I think so. Yeah. Cause I was there like three years ago to do a signing for the first book and it was wild. And I kind of wanted to go into the cafeteria, but they were just like, they escorted me to the library and then kind of like escorted me out. And I, (laughs) I totally wanted a cookie from the cafeteria nice. and I was going to be, I, I wanted to ask one of the kids. I'm like, is this, do you, they still call it skills. And that didn't get to happen. That would have been really cool. If that would have been, they, able to happen. they still have the uh, metal detectors there. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. And yeah. I mean, it's, it still is Brooklyn, man. So yeah, absolutely. Do? We we're talking a little bit earlier about you being, you know, a dad and like, trying to put your kids to sleep, but still finding the time to get all this kind of crazy work done, which we'll, we'll definitely get to more of, but where do you attribute having the, the energy to do that? Because I hear, you know, there's so many times where people are like, you know, I gotta, I gotta put my kids to sleep or I have to do all this. And then they, they put off the thing that they're doing. So what do you think motivates you or or keeps you going in that direction? I, I think because I, I grew up um, with a dad um, as much as I love him um, kind of reminded me of Jackie Gleason from the honeymooners, like a uh, big dreamer, you know, but not the biggest doer. You know, I remember one time I was like 12 years old and um, my dad was an alcoholic you know, and um, wasn't necessarily like a mean alcoholic, could be sometimes, you know, um, but a lot of the times it was like playing music, 
and telling us like what the songs really meant and like kind of cool stuff in a way, you know? And it was just kind of like, what do you really want to do with your life? And I was like, I was like 12. I was like, I want to play professional hockey. I want to play in the NHL. And he's like, uh, tomorrow, six o'clock in the morning, be up and I'll take you like, you know, to the park and you could shoot at me like all day. And I was like, awesome. And he's like, are you ready? And I'm like, yeah. And I knew like in my heart of hearts, I'm like, he ain't getting up. You know, like, there's no way he's not getting up. But I was up 530, took a shower, got dressed, threw my threw my jersey on. I was like on the door. And my mom was like, he ain't getting up. Go back to sleep. <laughs> but I went downstairs in front of my apartment building. And I just candled, you know, by myself for like, you know, three, four hours. And um, that was like a very important life lesson, you know, like if you want to get something done, you can pretty much count on having to do it yourself. You know, um, that's kind of like always the situation that I've always been in. I've always had to like do things by myself. It's like, I have so many friends that have their parents give them a home, you know, or pay for them to go through college and buy them a car. And I'm just like, I have never gotten a thing from my parents like that ever. Like the home that my dad lives in now, um, I haven't lived there in 14 years maybe, but I paid their first month, last month and security deposit, you know, like I did that. So it's like, so what motivated you to then, cause I know a number of people like, you know, growing up in Brooklyn and mm-hmm. us obviously going to Grady, like we didn't come from yeah. financial yeah. means, you know, as, as most of us at that school didn't, um, mm-hmm. how did you then turn it to be, to be a positive? How did, how did you then break that cycle? I mean, obviously, you know, all of our parents have their own challenges and, you know, it can be, easy to vilify people, but you oh, yeah. somehow have become this thing now where you are very active dad. Like, you know, I follow yeah. and I follow, I see you on social yeah. media. You, you're constantly in, you know, in pictures there together and doing stuff. And they're a part of the, the things that you're passionate about. So yeah. Do you think that was your response to those experiences? Oh yeah. Because it's just like, um, my dad's one of the smartest people that I've ever met in my entire life, you know, and super talented, you know? Um, and it's just like, I feel like I've never drank and I've never smoked my entire life. I've never done any drugs my entire life. Cause I just always attributed, like, I wonder what my dad could have done, you know, had he had if, a like, clean slate maybe. Yeah. And maybe like if he wasn't drunk or if he didn't smoke pot, you know, and stuff like that. Cause like, I remember, I mean, this is crazy. I don't think I've ever said this in an interview before, but it's like, I remember I was like 15 years old and I have a twin brother who's a maniac. He's like Kramer from Seinfeld. Um, Like no doubt. He's he's a madman. He's a madman. Men love him. Women love him. Goats love him. Like he's just, (laughs) he's living Loki. Yeah, he's I'm telling you, he I, it's like I'm Thor and he's Loki. Like it's that's that's what we, you know, and um, my parents sat us both down and they were like, listen, you guys are old enough now. Um, we're just going to tell you that we smoke pot and um, we're not going to hide it anymore. And I was just like, my heart sunk. I'm like, for real. And my brother was like, yeah, can I smoke with you? And they were like, absolutely not. You know, and it wasn't until he was like 18 that he started, you know, smoking with them. But I was just like in hell, you know, because I'm just like, this isn't me. I don't do I don't do this stuff, you know. So um, I just looked at them and I was just like, these are people that like whenever they're in a tough spot, they turn to something, you know, to try and take away the pain, to try and take away the anxiety. And I'm the type of person that like when I'm down, 
I try and in, invest in myself. I try to work on a project. I try and invest in people that I care about, people that I love. You know, I was just having a conversation with somebody today and I was like, there aren't a lot of things that like bring me joy. I was like, I could probably list them on one hand. And I'm like spending time with my wife, spending time with my children. Um, it's working on the stuff that I think, you know, that I take seriously, like my books and my comic book and, you know, listening to great music and, and, you know, like thinking, like actively thinking about the things that I want to do, but I'm like, everything else is just like things that I have to get done to get to those points, you know? Um, so I don't let a lot of the stress, like a lot of the little things stress me out anymore. You know, like I just try and focus on getting the stuff done that I need to get done so I can get to do the things that I want to do. And I just felt like growing up, like my parents let my parents and my brother, they let the, the little things really stress them out so much. And they had to partake in doing things that kind of made it impossible for them to ever keep their eyes like on any type of prize and like finish things they started. And those are like, that's like the thing that I try and pride myself upon the most that I'm a finisher that like, if I say I'm going to do something, that I finish it, that my word is important. If I tell you, I'm going to do something for you, that I'm going to do it. You know, it's like, and those are things that like, I never really had that example as a kid. Are you the only um, person really that's kind of involved in creative endeavors in your family? Yeah. Yeah. Um, funny. It's, it's very it's, similar, similar thing here where like, you know, my, and, and not as a, a slight to them it's just that you know the culture we came from it's like yeah you're either a blue collar fill in the blank period and that's it and so yeah. the idea of like any kind of creative expression almost felt like uh you know being scared because it's like hey i don't know what that frontier is i'm i'm worried for you that you want to do that <laughs> yep that's <laughs> i mean thing. my my dad still like doesn't get like what i do you know, he's successes like, and the facts that like you're you get you get paid published in that. like schools across the world and doesn't doesn't get it like at all. Like people people pay for it. Like that's <laughs> you know, like I want to ask you a couple of questions, uh, just to kind sure. of lean into some of the questions I've asked uh, previous guests and yeah. uh, just see what your thoughts are on that. Um, sure. In the past, there was a reverence and a place for artists, storytellers griots tribal elders uh do you think that that still exists today absolutely i mean uh it's like uh it's what podcasts are in a way now when you think about it it's just like um you have people that you want to listen to and that you'll be willing to kind of like shut off everything else that's going on and just sit down and, and take it in you know, or you'll be on the bus or the train and you'll block out everything else and you'll just take in their words. You know, um, I think comic books are definitely like part of that, like the old, like back in the day, like the tribal, you know, elder telling like, you know, the story of something, you know, I think comic books are definitely in the same vein as that. I think video games are in the same vein too, because you get to experience the story yourself in a way that like reading doesn't necessarily um I offer couldn't and that's read, it man I, I couldn't read when I was younger like even when I was in school mm -hmm. if I had to read something out loud yeah it's just funny now because I'm in the profession of acting and and reading and I still like I, I still get nervous when I do that but I've mm -hmm. worked through it enough that I can kind of get past it but I mention it because I would actually I was way more into video games in high middle school and high school and mm -hmm. into stories and that's how i got my uh, storytelling element there and was like emotionally invested in these things and like you oh, may, yeah. I heard you say other times on other uh podcasts that i've listened to with you on that you know where some people stopped or they had a cut off like around high school or a couple of years into college like you never yeah i just stopped. never stopped um like i mean i was reading before i started kindergarten um i learned how to read incredibly quick um, I always loved reading. That was the one thing, all the stuff I've said about my upbringing so far, like we didn't have a lot of money. And my dad always made sure that like every weekend my ass was in the library checking out like two or three books. And um, that went a super, super long way. And then um, when I couldn't sleep as a kid, 
and my father was playing Dragon Warrior or Wonder Boy in Monster Land or Legend of Zelda, and I was reading the story along with him, he would just be like, that's crazy. That Like, I would be four years old and reading along Dragon Warrior with him, and he, he's just like, this is insane. Like, you're, and I'm like, mm-hmm. You know, so all of these things it's like i try and tell there's so many people in academia that just don't take video games and comic books seriously and i'm just like any way you can get someone to think about the world and think about themselves and how they affect the world around them is a successful like um work of art you know and it's like video games it's art comic books it's art literature it's art you know it's all the same I think one thing that you do that's actually pretty amazing and it ties into that first question I asked you is that if you ask people about video games, they can tell you what their favorite games are, but they have no idea the source of the people who created these games or who toiled endlessly to make this thing come alive. And in um, Minds Behind the Games, the, the book series that you wrote, you get into that like very in depth with a lot of these authors. Do you think that I feel like it might be the first time that they're really getting the spotlight in that way, other than like smaller publications or monthly kind of things, books in that way. What was their response to you? Um, It's funny because there, there's a couple of books that are similar to mine in the fact that they've like gathered interviews and um, I talk to as many video game like historians as I possibly can. And I remember I got a book that it was like that. It was like the yellow pages. And it was, it was essentially a collection of Q and A's with all of these developers. And, um, but it was Q and A's. There was like the writer didn't like really like create context for the reader or anything. It's just like, oh, this is a guy that created Golden X. Here's 10 questions. It was like the same questions every interview and stuff like that. And I'm just like, readers deserve more. Bit, right? What? There's a little cookie cutter, right? Like they just sort yeah. of... Yeah. Like- yeah. You know, it just, it needed more depth. It needed more context. So I, you know, great guy. I love, I love the book because for me, it's a source of information, but it's just like, I felt like, because t- I, I want... I want scholars to connect to my stuff, but I want the average reader to connect with it too. I want a 12, 13 year old to read it. I want a 30 year old to read it. I want a 50 year old to read it. So it's just like, um, I stress this to all the developers. Like when I speak to them, I'm like, I want, this is like an opportunity for you to tell your story. And I do something very different from a lot of authors because um, I've spoken to many developers over the years that are just like, yeah, I was in this book with this guy totally like changed my words around and that's not how I said it. That's not how I meant it. So it's just like from day one, I've always told the developers, after I finish a chapter, you will be the first person to read it. And any concerns that you have, I want you to bring them to me before we go to publication. And we're going to meet halfway. I'm not going to change something that you said, because now you've changed your mind or whatever. I'm like, but, you know, I want you to say it the way you want to say it, you know, and um it's helped a lot. Like I get, I've, I've gotten plenty of um, respect from these, from these men and women. Um, And, and yeah, like uh, it's been in the beginning, it was hard because they didn't know me despite the fact that I was a video game journalist for 10 years, you know? Um, Who was the first person that that said yes? um, I'm pretty sure it was Michael Menheim who did um, mutant league football, but um, I interviewed him when I was at NBC and when I was at Examiner. So he was like kind of easy because it was like, that's like um, what I made sure that like the first two or three people that I, that I picked that I had interviewed before for other projects because I knew they were big names and I knew that if I could get them. So like um, Michael Menheim was definitely one. And then, um, oh my God, his name just totally escapes me. And I'm, I'm a video game historian and his name just totally escaped me. Dude, It'll come not, back to me. Man. You're a dad of yeah. you know, two kids. You just put like, yeah. I appreciate you taking the time. I know but, I'm um, like burning the candle of both. No, it's okay. <laughs> it's all right. But it was the guy that did Epic Mickey um, okay. for the Wii, but he also did Deus Ex. 
his name's going to come come to me later and i'll be like oh boom, boom. Yeah, and i said oh huge, but, man that's in like yeah. multiple meme culture now where they're talking about all the the it's uh, one of the most influential theory. games of all time yeah, exactly. yeah so i said oh do you remember me i'm from nbc and he's like yeah i'm like well i'm actually writing a book now um can I interview you about Deus Ex? And he was like, sure. So it was like all those pieces started to come together. And then I was lucky because then every time I would pitch somebody, I would be like, oh, well, I just spoke to so-and-so. And I just spoke to Michael Menheim. Like I made sure that I did that. And then I got the guy that did Pitfall, David Crane. And that helped a lot. That gave me a lot of street cred. And then I just started stacking them on top of each other. And um, then we just hit the I mean, I didn't even know if I was going to do a sequel or not. And then what happened was all the developers that didn't get back to me before the first book came out, they just started contacting me. And then I spoke to my publisher and I was going to do a big sequel. And they said, no, they were like, you have enough stuff here that you could do three more books. Like mine's buying the adventure games, mine's buying the sports Mm -hmm. games, mine's buying the shooter games. And I was just like, whoa, like, is this happening? And they're like, yeah, we're going to sign you to a three book deal like right now. And I'm just like, okay, all right. Like, so, and that was, that was like two years ago. So now I'm writing book seven. So it's just like, it's been, that's, in, that's amazing, man. I it's mean, been wild. Been, I, gotta, I mean, from the first one to now is, I mean, it was only, it was only four and a half years ago, you know? So, so were you just doing chapters, crazy. chapters at night or were you trying to fit in? Yeah. Into oh yeah. Room? Yeah. In like free time? Um, I, in my free time, bef- like I usually don't start teaching before covid at like until like eight o'clock in the morning so i would get into work at like 5 30 um and i would write for two and a half hours um write transcribe research whatever i would have to do and then i would like usually teach for two hours and then have like a two hour break so i would just go right back to my office write for another two hours and i would teach like my last two classes go home around like two o'clock and then i would be on the bus from like 2 40 to like four o'clock and while i was on the bus i was polishing and editing and stuff like that. So it's just like, I would teach for four hours and I would write for like six or seven. And then I would make sure that like, by the time I came home that I would have as little to do as possible. So this way I could spend time with my wife and my kids, but you know, that didn't always happen. Um, And then when they would fall asleep, I would get back on it and I would write until like one o'clock in the morning, um, sleep for like, sleep for like four hours, you know, leave leave for work at like 4 45 5 o'clock get to work at 5 30 start all over again so yeah what five wild. days a week essentially teaching five days a week yep and that was the mm-hmm. process for you that was were you the just, process. Were you just motivated when you started that book or has that been kind of your well the, your before consolidated the books, schedule prior to that that's pretty much the consolidated schedule because before the books like i mean i still run review fix every day so like i would just go in and i would work on the site and I would, I never stopped working on the site in between like all the books, the site has been updated every day for the past, like 11 and a half years. So it was just like, I've always had stuff to do. And I will say that before I started doing the book, I spent a lot of time um, in academia, helping run programs at my college. And I just realized that um, I was working hard for other people. I was making other people look a lot better than they were. And uh, the book was part of like my way of saying, you know what? I'm sick and tired of making other people look good. I'm 33. Um, I was at, at, you know, CUNY for 11 years at that point. Um, Full time, did everything right. But um, I felt like I wasn't getting the respect that I deserved. And I'm like, you know what? So I'll continue to work here and do the best that I possibly can and do right by my students every single day, but I'm going to do something for me, you know? Um, Cause that's the thing. If you're a writer and you haven't written a book, that's always going to be the question. So it's just like, I'd covered two Super Bowls, three seasons of Saturday Night Live, um, presidential election, Sandy Hook, Hurricane uh, Sandy, like tons of stuff for NBC covered Sundance a couple of times, Tribeca, Comic-Cons as a journalist. And people would always be like, oh, that sounds great. Have you written a book yet? <laughs> so it was like, you're right. Well, somehow I haven't written a book gold, yet. That's the gold standard of, of that yeah. industry, or at least seemingly to people when, you know, yeah, be the equivalent so, of being like, hey, well, what, what movie have you been in? Or what, you know? Yeah. That makes sense. 
So I was just like, all right, I'm going to get the book done. And then it's just like, um, it, th the first one was the hardest one because I was just learning, you know, how to do everything. But now, I mean, now they're like Pringles in a way, you know, it's like, I just signed the contract for the seventh book and my manuscript isn't due until April of next year, but I'm more than halfway done already, you know? Have and it's you just created like, a rhythm for yourself essentially now uh, because you, you went through all the bumps and ups and downs of that first absolutely. one. Absolutely. So yeah. each one probably Absolutely. gets more efficient for you now. I'm super, like, I am super efficient now. Like, I totally, like, um, I'm, like, so far ahead of where, like, I need to be. Um, and then I just make sure now that I chime in with my sources every couple of weeks to make sure how they're doing because, like, I need them. I'm not, I'm not a YouTuber. I am not an influencer. I am not a TikToker. You know, like I'm a journalist that interviews people. So it's just like I have to make sure that like my sources are giving me the answers that I need. And I need to always have an interview like on the table that I have to get ready to prepare for. So just like I was speaking to a couple of developers a couple of days ago and they're like, oh, well, I'll have answers for you next week. And I'm like, that's perfect because I'm finishing the Shadow of Colossus chapter this week for the PS2 book. So I'm like, I'm going to finish that and then I'll get on to the next person. And then while I'm working on that person, then I'll chime in with another person. So it's like, if I can get a chapter done a week, four or five chapters done a month, I could write a book in seven months, six months, if everything goes the way that it's supposed to. And we're talking 130,000 words, like a 250, 300 page book. So it's just about being as efficient as possible. And then when it's slow, edit the stuff that I already have, you know? So it's just like, you know, if I finish the shadow of Colossus chapter this week and I don't get answers from another person, then I'll just edit some of the older stuff that I have. So this way later on, I don't have to edit, you know? So it's just I like, mean, you just have to, it's insane. <laughs> I'm in, I'm in awe, honestly, man, because aside from the writing, you've done uh, voice acting on the video game, the Padre, which mm -hmm. has a sequel Correct. Has a sequel that, that came work? out in February. Oh, yeah, out in February. And, um, okay. In February, on Steam, on Steam. right? Yeah. Okay. So, and I've got on, like that's... five other games that I'm on, I'm on the development teams right now. So I'm, and um, that's why I'm saying, like you, to me, you're an anomaly amongst people that I know, and I know a lot of people who are, you know, um, I try my best because you know it's been said that you know the the five people you hang out the most with are like kind of going to be reflective of the things that you're able to accomplish yourself. Because if I hang out with someone like you, for example, the bullshit meter is very low. Like you can't <laughs> waste someone's time that is constantly performing on a high level. So that's, again, I respect you a ton. And that's why like, um, uh, you know, even you helping me in my, my project, like a, a comic book that I'm working on, you somehow mm -hmm. made the time to be really, uh, positive and helpful and give me hints. So I, I respect that a ton. Um, Thank you. You also have done uh, commentary on pro wrestling. You were an yeah, announcer. Oh, a ring announcer. Yeah. Ring oh. announcer. It's like, man, I, I, all right. So I got to ask this question then because there's so many things and, you know, within an hour or so, we're not going to be able to hit all of sure. them, but yeah. Do you see yourself as an artist, a uh, craftsman, both neither something else altogether so um one of my heroes like all-time heroes is teddy roosevelt um because teddy roosevelt is just an ass kicker you know poet soldier statesman renaissance man just you can't put a label on teddy roosevelt you know um and it's just like um I think that's what I, I wanted about you too, man. Cause then in an age of, uh, you know, Oh, what's your brand? What's your elevator pitch? It's like, I couldn't, if I was telling, if I had like five seconds to tell someone about you, I think I might have to talk about the journalism, but I'd be like, dude, that's not enough. Yeah. Time. Yeah. It's like when I put my resume together, I'm just kind of like, shit, like it's hard, you know, because it's like, I feel like I'm more than the sum of my parts, you know? Um, it's like right now I'm at lesser known comics and I'm writing Condry, but I'm also helping them with social media outreach. And I get a lot of our writers and artists like on podcasts and stuff, because I'm, I'm good at that. I'm good at PR and things like that. And it's just like, I think my CEO, 
he understands that like I am like more than just like one thing and it's like I never want to be classified as just one thing I want to just keep accomplishing things and um yeah I, I would say like if I had to kind of pigeonhole myself and call myself one thing I would just call myself a content creator because it's like I'm just whether it's articles for the web I, I mean I write for old school gamer magazine I've written for, since their first issue so I write for magazines I write for the web I write books I do voice acting um, I speak to professional wrestlers all the time, you know, about like the moves that they use in the ring, how they use them and stuff like that. Like I've helped several indie wrestlers get into the business and like understand their character and things like that. The whole comic book thing that I'm doing now, which is extremely important to me, um, the voice acting. Um, I'm, I'm on like four or five different teams right now for four or five different video games serving as a writer and a voice actor. So it's just like. Yeah, I've just I've got so many cool things that I want to do in today's in today's world. Being a content creator, renaissance man slash polymath, (laughs) (laughs) how, you know, how do you how do you do that in today's world? You know, it's you're doing it, but I'm just trying to maybe find the little seed of like. Because you can see someone and it almost seems like other other worldly you know, for, for like yeah. better terms, like how, how do you, you know, what do you think it means to, to be doing that in today's world for yourself? Um, for me, it's freedom. For me, it's kind of like, um, I know what my full-time job is. I know it puts food on the table for my family, but I know that like all the other stuff that I'm doing is just as important because it, it makes me happy and it affects people. And, but I mean, at the same time too, um, it's lonely, you know, it's just like you said before that, like you can kind of gauge where you're going to go based on the five people that you hang out with. I mean, I don't hang out with five people. I don't, you know, I it's just like, um, because it's like you, you seem so focused, but then I guess that's the other side of the coin that you don't see is like the commitment that you're yeah. putting in now. Yeah. It's like I hang out with people and it's like they usually like want to pick my brain and they want to vent to me. Um, And I don't really have that. I don't really have a person that like I can I can vent to really, you know, and it's just like it's hard because sometimes people will think that like I come across a certain way, you know, heartfully, I'll heartfully volunteer for that. (laughs) You need to call someone and just say you know, Hey, what's up, dude. I got this going on. Please feel free anytime. Thanks, man. It's, it's fucking hard. You know, it's hard to just sit down sometimes and just be like, okay, I need to get all this shit done and stay up until like, I remember the last issue of Condry. Um, I stayed up until like four o'clock in the morning um, from like 11 when my wife went to bed and I stayed up until like four o'clock in the morning and I I lettered what a quick precursor for that. So Condry is your book that is published through lesser known comics. And this yes. book is something that you've had envisioned in your mind since you were 18. So basically you were in yeah. Haiti, probably in the yeah. lunchroom and you were like, this is my idea for a, a comic. Yeah. And it took, you know, X number of years now to, yep. to make it happen. So yeah, okay. it took 20 years, three different artists and stuff like that, you know, and until I finally found Kieran, who's amazing. Um, he is awesome, but by it, the way. I'd love to he, have him on here at some point too. He would love, I'm sure he would love to come on. He's awesome. He's like one of the most laid back, like cool people that you could ever meet. Like I could go to him one day. Yeah. Kieran, you know, um, the next issue, you're only going to get like 1% pay of like what you got. And, and he would go, okay, no problem. Like he's just, he loves to create, you know, and um, he's so just as passionate a, as me. What keeps a 20 year you know, project brewing in the crock pot and you're up at like one in the morning getting this thing done still. Whereas I just like it less than, you know, a week, a year. Oh yeah. Then it's just like over the, the, the it fizzles out. So how, how do you, can you explain that? Yeah. I, cause I just felt like it was always good enough, you know, and I probably showed it to like 15 to 20 people over the last 20 years. And every single one of them was like, this is, this is awesome. This sounds like a movie. This sounds like a, an ongoing series. And I'm just like, 
this this is the funny part because I was originally going to like scrap the comic book idea and I was going to write like a book. I was going to write like a fictional like novel and a um, name. No, no, I was going to be okay. I was still going to be Patrick Hickey. Never out. And that's the thing as a journalist, it's like putting your name on everything is just like it's like a badge of honor, you know, just like my name. And then everything below that is like the truth. You know, it's like for, for most journalists, that's like, that's what it feels like. It's like your stamp is on it. It's your real name. Anyone can find you on social media. They could tell you that your stuff sucks. They could tell you that your stuff is great. It's just like when you, when you write journalistically, it's just like, here, here I am, you know, like I'm right here, you know? So as a author, I, I feel like I'm, I'm the same way. Um, but uh, I took everything out of like comic book sc- uh, script and storyboards and I put it into novel form. And at that point I was like through three artists and I was just like, I don't know if I'm ever gonna find an artist for this. So then I was just like, you know what? I'm gonna turn it into a book series. And then that kind of like, I stopped doing it after like a month, but everything was still there. So we had like 12 issues, 10 to 12 issues all written like in a book. And it's like, it's like over a hundred pages. Um, so then just one day I was just like, you know what? It was like the first Minds Behind the Games was out and then the Minds Behind Adventure Games was finished and I was working on the Minds Behind the Sports um, and Shooter at the same time. And I was just like, yeah, I want to do the comic book now too. And my wife was like, you're crazy. You're writing two books at the same time. Now you want to do a comic book. I'm like, yep. So I went on Facebook and I was just like, I need an artist. And my friend Tommy introduced me to Kieran. And instead of giving Kieran the storyboards, that didn't work with the other three artists for various reasons. One, one guy made it look like an anime that that wasn't what I wanted. Another guy made, made the main character look like cloud strife. That's not what I wanted. Well, it's gritty New York city. So you, you can't think, uh, you know, final fantasy seven, yeah. dragon ball Z yeah. or any of this kind of stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The third guy was just a shit talker. Part of my French. It was just like, he took four months and he, he wanted to write it. Like he went, he was like, Oh, we should make Kanji like a Viking and we should change the setting. And I'm like, no, I just need, I'm like, bro, I just need an artist. I don't want to share this IP with you. It's mine. I'm like, I just like, it's like, I was, I'm like Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley and, and Peter Chris in, in kiss. Yeah. And I just wanted, a, I wanted a drummer to come into my band, just play the drums, you know? And, um, so what I did with Kieran was instead of giving him the storyboards, I was like, you know what? Read the first 20 pages of the novel. And he was just, he read it and he was just like, this feels like a movie. He's like, you totally like wanted, he's like, you got me so into this character and this world. And, and it was like, we Vulcan mind melded and he just created everything. And um, the first pages that I saw, I was just like, this was, this was the reason why I waited 20 years because I just knew I knew that like once it was like done properly that people would appreciate it and um I never gave up on it but then that's the thing it's just like I started college and then um then I started writing for uh newspapers and magazines and then NBC and then I was teaching full-time and then I got married and then the book so it was just like I never forgot about it but I was never able to like be in a situation where I could like focus on it as much as possible and then just once I met Kieran, I knew that was like the final piece of the puzzle. And then everything started to come together. And then that took two years too, until we found the publisher. So, so that's, that's amazing. It's like, it was always in the back of your mind and always. you knew that it would be coming back up again. It's just that, you know, instead of it getting lost in time and space, you just knew that mm-hmm. it was going to come back at some point. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, whenever I would have some time to myself, or like, again, like I told you that there are sometimes there's like slow weeks where a developer doesn't get back to me while I'm working on the book. I would go back to the script, the Conjury script, and I would just edit it and tighten it and, you know, go, mm, you know what, that probably shouldn't happen. Or, oh, you know what, maybe this would be, you know, and it's just like for 20 years, I've dreamed this story, you know, like I've had dreams of like stuff happening in this world and, um, it's because of that. I just knew that it was something that I, I, I shouldn't give up on that. I couldn't give up on. So I'm just happy that I didn't, that I just stuck with it because again, like God forbid anything happens to me. Like now I know that I saw it through and that like it was published. So it's just like, that was the first big goal. Now I want to tell all of the story that I possibly can. Like I want to keep it going for as long as possible. So it was like goal one is finished now on to goal two, you know? 
That's beautiful. I think, um, I'm curious, was there a specific moment that you realized you wanted to, usually if I'm talking to somebody, I say, you know, is there a specific moment you knew you wanted to do this, but your, your writing, I guess we'll say that the writing or the creative writing or the content creation, was there a moment in your life that you knew that you wanted to do that with the rest of your life, essentially, or at least a good portion of your life currently? And if so, could you share what that moment was? Yeah, sure. Like I've always been like a weird kid. Like I'm six foot four, I'm 250 pounds. So it was like, I was an athlete always, you know, and then it was hard in high school because I love basketball. I could shoot a three pointer and stuff like that, but it's just like, I played hockey, I played football and my high school, our high school didn't have a football team. I would have totally played high school football. Which ironically, they had it years later. They ended up getting yep. one, also getting a wrestling yeah. team. And in my head, I'm like, oh, I, man, what about us? <laughs> I would have totally wrestled too. You know, yeah. I went into all of that stuff. So it's like, I didn't have, I didn't have those outlets. So it's like, I ended up working in the library and reading a lot and things like that. But um, I remember being, and this is like 1989, 1990, being four, five, six, seven years old where I would just get like pages of loose leaf paper and just write players' names, baseball players' names, hockey players' names, basketball players' names, and just like make teams like, and then like put their stats from like a certain year and be like, Oh, imagine like how good the Yankees would have been if they had George Brett playing third base from 1981 on the 1990 team with pre Kevin fantasy Moss, baseball like, pre fantasy, ba- but like, and then like, I remember one time my mother showed like these papers to like my dad and my dad is like, cause I, now I'm like, again, five, six, seven years old. My dad would be like, what is this? And I'm like, this is like, the 1990 Cincinnati Reds, if they didn't trade Ken Griffey senior. And if Eric Davis went to the Baltimore Orioles for this guy and blah, blah, blah. And my dad just like, you need to go out and play more. Like you, you shouldn't be just like, like, how do you know, like, are these stats right? And I'm like, yeah, they're right. And he goes, how do you know? And I'm like, well, cause I have the almanac. I checked out the almanac from the library and I, I have them memorized. And then he would just be like, well, how many home runs did Don Mattingly hit in 1989? I'd be like, 23. And he goes, what? And I'm like, 23. Well, how many did he hit in 1995? Like, and he's like, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, nothing. Like, there's nothing <laughs> wrong with me, you know? Not and realizing so it's just like, him thinking that, oh, you know, telling you to play was the right thing versus like, oh, there's something yeah. that's being harnessed here. Yeah. So it's just like, I love history. I love statistics, like in sports and stuff like that. And so I used to just make like these little crib sheets and stuff. And then, um, then I I really started reading comic books and I really started playing video games. And when I would play video games, like Legend of Zelda, I would go all the way to the corner of the map just to see like what was there, you know? And like, I would try and do all sorts of crazy stuff. And I would try and like, see if I could break the game, find like glitches and things like that. Um, So I've always been like one of those people so but like i said i I really wanted to be a pro hockey player and if it wasn't for the car accident that i got into when i was 18 i don't know maybe i would be like a minor league hockey player or something like that you know but it was just like by the time i was like 18 and a half after that car accident it was just like okay you're not going to play hockey so you need to figure it out and i spent like a good year year and a half um in a couple of bands um can I just stop reading a, a lot? What, yeah. was the, what was the state of mind? Cause I'll say this one time I got injured in 2010, my mm-hmm. um, uh, rib had dislocated from my sternum. Oh. And I remember not having insurance. And I went to the doctor I went to like a chiropractor and the guy tells me, he's like, yeah, well, with this type of injury, you'll probably never be able to do. He, he was saying basically you'd never be able to do uh, martial arts or jujitsu again. I literally, mm-hmm. I started crying. Yeah. Cause I was like, yeah, no, like you can't not knowing that maybe that was inaccurate knowledge, but sure. at the moment I'm thinking a doctor said this to me and it's a wrap, you know, what yeah. was your, how, how did you deal with that information of like thinking at 18, you're like, Hey, maybe I'll play minor league or maybe I'll play, you know, was that, I handled diminished? it probably the wrong way. Yeah. Um, definitely diminished. Um, I ate a lot, <laughs> ate unhealthy 
put on a lot of weight. Um, I started to focus on other things like non-physical things like, you know, singing, playing guitar, um, writing. I kind of became a completely different person. And it wasn't until like two and a half years ago, like I had weight loss surgery and I just changed like the way that I eat. I changed my exercise reg regimen and I've kept all the weight off. And now I feel like I can do all of those things that I, f I literally like I'm 37 and I feel like I'm 18 again. Like, I was going to say, you, you look know? healthy last time, even last time I saw you compared to now, like you, you've trimmed down even more. You look, you look yeah. vibrant. Like you're always doing something. Thank you. So, yeah. I feel you know, great. Genuinely, you know, I like, I make sure, like, even today, today was so humid, disgusting out. I made sure I got like 13,000 steps in that. Like I was just walking, getting it in, you know, even when it's hot, even when it's raining, you know, just get those steps in and stuff like that. So then this way, like, if I feel like I want a cookie, I don't feel bad because I know I put the work in and stuff like that. But, um, at that time, I just totally, I just, it, it sucked. It sucked. And, um, but at the same time too, if that accident doesn't happen and I don't put on the weight, I don't devote myself to that other side of myself, you know, to, to the writing and but to was the, the learning. What was the, the, cause the, I think, or at least in my mind, there always seems to be a moment because at that moment, you very easily could have diverged into directions that maybe you saw that weren't as great oh, yeah. up or things like that. So was there something, or maybe just in your, I'm always curious about those moments. With sure. People, so, you know? so it was like drugs and alcohol was never an option. It's just like when I was in bands, um, I was around people that smoked oh, pot and did all of crazy course. shit all the time. And they just thought it was so crazy that like, I was like, I could not be corrupted. You know, they were just like, you sure you don't want some of this? You sure you don't want some of that? You know, was it like a straight like, edge thing or was it more just like a Patrick Hickey? Like, this is my way of doing it since I was. Yeah, a kid it's thing. always been. Yeah, it was a, it was the Pat Hickey. Like, just it's not even a choice. You know, it's like even at my at my wedding, I didn't have champagne. You know, um, my wife could tell you um, one of our first dates, we went to like this really nice Mexican restaurant in Park Slope. And they had like this dessert that they like set on fire and stuff. And I, and I took like a bite out of it and I could taste that it was like alcohol, that the alcohol was like in the, in the food and I spit it out. And I, I was like, I'll be right back. And I had to go to the bathroom and I like literally like rinsed my tongue off because I did not want to swallow it. I did not want it in my body, you know? And um, some people are just like, Oh, it's not a big deal. But like, for me, it's just like, Nope. Um, so like drugs and alcohol was like never a uh, thing, but like, I remember it was like late at night. It was like four o'clock in the morning one night. And I was watching like Batman, the animated series on my um, computer. And I was playing like Boulder's Gate Dark Alliance on my PS2 or something like that. And um, my father comes in and he's like, what are you doing? And I'm just like, what, what do you think I'm doing? Like chilling, I'm hanging out, you know? And he's like, no, no, no. Like with your life. And I was just like, I don't know. And he's like, well, you better fucking figure it out soon. And um, I was pissed when he left. He left my room and I was just like, because I was like 19 and I was just like really pissed. It's like, who does this guy think he is? You know, like, wow. So it was just like the next day I registered for Kingsborough online. And later that week I went in and it was so different. It was like you were in like this big like room. And you sat down with a guidance counselor and they picked your classes for you and stuff like that. And I ended up sitting down with the head of the journalism program at the time, Bob Blaisdell, who's a coworker now. And uh, we were talking and he was just like, what do you want to take? And I was just like, well, I, I want to be a sports writer. And he was just like, oh, I'm the head of the journalism program. Because my whole thing was like, if I can't play hockey, then I want to write about it. You know, if I can't, you know, it's like I played baseball for Grady and for a little while and I love baseball. So I'm just like, I can't play baseball. If I can't play hockey, then I want to write about them. I understand the sports, you know? So, uh, that's what ended up happening. And then it was just like six months later, I'm editor in chief of Kingsborough's newspaper. I'm editing, I'm interviewing David Wright in, at Shea stadium without a degree, you know, um, without any type of journalism degree, you know? And then like a year later, I'm covering the Brooklyn Cyclones. I'm covering professional baseball. Two years after that, I'm covering professional hockey. I'm on the road with with a hockey team, you know? So it's just like, I just, I hit the ground 
running. Do you, you think know, from somebody then. else came into the room while you were playing video games and said that to you, like any other person, would it have gotten you to do the same thing that next day? Or maybe I don't think anybody, I don't think, dad? yeah, I don't think anybody else would have said it. Um, my mom, um, she was extremely passive. Like, uh, as long as like I did right by her, like that I was a good son and I was respectful and kept my room clean. <laughs> and when I, when I went to the store, brought her back a Milky Way or a Snapple, I was perfect to her, you know? So you she didn't would have never, to do too I would, much more. Didn't have to be, do too much more. Son. My dad was kind of like, you have my name, you're a reflection of me. And I was kind of like, well, you haven't set the bar very high, you know? So, but it was like that, that was a moment that, um, you kind of came in with a real, with a real moment, despite, you know, obviously yeah. we, we all have these really deep relationships and connections with our families and we know the particulars about their lives and all this stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. I think he, 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 maybe he brought a little heat and, and kind of oh, lit, yeah. lit it under your ass a little bit, you know, <laughs> that's the thing too. It's like, I tell people this all the time, like every time and it's happened, it's happened probably like five or six times in my life where, um, somebody pisses me off and they really like regret it because I'm not, vin I'm not a vindictive type of person, but it's just like, best they make me, success kind they, of thing. yeah, they make me raise the bar. You know, it's just like, I remember when I told the head of the journalism program at Kingsborough that I was going to write this book. Um, we had shared an office together for 10 years and um, he was like, yeah, go write a book kid. You know, like he was kinda just kind of like a little bit. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Like I remember showing him the contract for the first book. And instead of saying congratulations, his answer was, well, you know, this doesn't mean that like they're going to release the book. You still have to finish it. And then he went on this like 20 minute diatribe about um, a short story that he was planning that still isn't finished, you know? So it's just like, I have people like I've encountered people like that my entire life. So it's just like, I've always been like the younger, I've always hung out with older people. Um, so I've always been like the younger, like, Oh, you know, just relax. You work too hard. Blah, blah, blah. Just tone it down, tone it down. And I'm just like, I only go one way, you know? And that's the reason why, like you said before, those five people, I don't have them because it's like, um, no, not too many contemporaries probably for what you're doing actually. Now that I think about that, it. Well, yeah, that too, you know, and it, but it's just like, you, you nailed it before when you said like the bullshit meter, because it's just like, I'll, I'll talk to somebody and they'll be like, no, oh, when well, I told I you, dude, this. when I told you that I was like, okay, Hey, I'm writing my, this draft will be done on X yeah. day. Like a couple of days before you were like, Hey man, you know, looking forward, like you were being yeah. nice about it. I think, yeah. but then also well, I love that about you though, too, because like it was done on that day, but also you've done everything that you said for you, would. you know, because <laughs> yeah. I was like, I can't, I was like, if I ask you for help and then I'm not ready on the day that I say that I'm going to be, then I would yeah. be absolutely embarrassed. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's like you kind of set a good bar as well. And maybe that's the, the teacher in you or the, some of the stuff that you do already. That's it's like, it's funny. Cause I say that all the time. It's just like, I, if somebody tells me that they want to do something, I'll be like, all right. So these are the things that like, I'm pretty sure that you need to do. So if you need help, I'm here. But then what happens is like people fizzle out. And then when they fizzle out, I'm just kind of like, I don't want that like aura around me. You know what I'm saying? Like Nobody I want to be time for that. <laughs> yeah. Like I want to be around people that are doing great things that are busting their ass that like that I look to and go, yo, wow. And I don't have a lot of that, you know? So it's just like, I try and keep like, I never compare my creative process to anybody. And like, I have other authors that I speak to a lot of time and they're like, Oh, you're just coming out with books so fast. I wish that I could write as fast as you. And I'm like, don't wish that you do anything like me. And I'm like, just do you, you know, do it your way, finish it, get it done. You know? So it's just like, that's, that's like, at the end of the day, I just want to be around people that like do what they say they're going to do, do it to the best of their ability, do it their way, you know, and do create work that they're proud of, you know, so I could be proud of them too, you know, um, I touched it's on hard. A, a little bit. Um, I mean, we rather touched on it a little bit prior, but yeah. um, how do you navigate being a, you know, this multifaceted content creator in your personal life? 
and in today's world, like you touched on it, but if you could give a little bit, it's, it's hard, you know, it's hard because it's just like, sometimes like when you try and explain to people like the things that they need to do so you could help them because you've been there, you know, their own insecurities, like make they try and act as if like you come off a certain way. You know, I have been told like that I have that air of like, oh, I'm better than you. Blah, blah, blah. And I, I'm the type of person that I'm just like, I don't say that I'm better than you. And then people will go, yeah, but I can tell that you're thinking it, you know, and I'm just like, well, if you're if we're getting that deep, if you if you know what I'm thinking, then why are you asking me for help? You know, like if you already know like what I'm thinking, you yeah, know, I mean, there's so- an, like it's I tell people I tell people that like I've spoke I've spoken to students at at. I went to Buffalo State College through the uh, EOP mm-hmm. program, Educational Opportunity mm-hmm. Program. If not for that program, I would not have gone to college. It just wouldn't mm-hmm. in the cards. They gave me a chance because they were like, you have potential. You just don't come from the means. So here's yeah. a shot, kid, basically, is yeah. what it was. So I tell those students, I'm like, when you go and you ask someone for help, you in, are inherently admitting that you don't know something. And it's okay yes. to admit that you it's don't okay. know. And to reach out. But if you do that, then you can't also be. It's hard to ask for help and then also be skeptical of the person that you are actively asking for help. You ha- It has to be one or the other. You have to be kind of you almost have to take a step back in the apprentice role. Like I'm maybe what a year, a year and a half older than you. But when I mm-hmm. come and ask you for advice, you're like my sensei, basically. I'm like, yo, well, you're like, my... yeah, we're on the same page. You know, you know like, I'm that's... like, hey, you, you te- teach me what you know, because you've spent years doing that. Like, if you asked me about acting stuff, then I would feel a sense of confidence to be like, oh, hey, Absolutely. this is my experience. This is what I can tell you about that, you know, take it or leave it. Um, Absolutely. And the weight of that experience is there. So I, when I speak to you about certain things, I feel that like, you're like, hey, man, it, it's the, it's the gravitas that people have when they just put in years of time into something. So, yeah, it's uh, hard. You know, it's hard. Um, it's, a, it's, you know what it is too. It's just like, because we're young and we've done a lot of stuff. And and the thing is too, like with us, it's just like we on the surface, if people see us, they see, you know, like lighter skin person that's kind of successful and they feel like more doors have been opened for us. Bro. Than- I told people, I used to tell people, you know, I stole an extra, row of lunch tickets from the principal's office at Grady because yeah. you know not yeah. we weren't we weren't dead broke impoverished but mm-hmm. one lunch wasn't going to do it so i used to oh, yeah. go and and i would go in on a different period and grab lunch and try to like get the nu- the nutrition to to make this stuff happen it's like yeah. it's kind of crazy you know and and that's the thing that side note but assumptions fill the creative world all the time. And it's like, how do you, that's a side question, I guess. How do you kind of navigate those assumptions about who you are, you know, and, and the things that you do. So it's so funny. I'll tell you two quick stories that totally connect to this. So it was just like, the first one is I had a student um, probably like two years ago, right before COVID and um, African-American girl, woman, she was awesome. She was lazy, but talented. And I would kick her in her ass whenever she, needed it because I just saw that she had it. She had it. And um, at the end of, and she made it, she made it almost painful at times for me to get like another draft out of her to get her to go interview somebody one more time and things like that. But at the end of the class, she said something to me and she was just like, um, I'll never forget it. She was just like, professor, I just want to let you know that like, I hate white people, um, but you're really cool. Like you are like, the coolest white person that I've ever met in my entire life. Like I did not expect you to like care as much about me as you did. And I was just like, I told her flat out. I was just like, I never ever judged you, um, stereotyped you or thought anything of you based on the color of your skin. I was like the first time that I actually like connected you with your name is when I read your work. And I read your work and I was like, this is somebody that I could help. I'm like, the color of your skin means absolutely nothing to me. It's my job to help you, you know, be as solid at this as possible for you to like be able to make a living doing this. I'm like, color of your skin has nothing to do with it. And then like, we kind of connected over it, you know, and she's, I helped, I wrote her a letter of recommendation for uh, NYU and she got in. 
super proud of her. It's beautiful. You know, um, but it's just like part of that is from going to Grady and seeing like I was treated different because I was white. You know, I was I was for the first time in my life, I was the victim of racism and I didn't like it. But it was just kind of like now to, to be this is to what other fair, people this have is, to deal this with. It's crazy because a lot of people don't realize and it doesn't shift the nature of the world and how people no. are, but there are experiences like, you know, maybe there was like a handful of, you know, co- I even hate like race terms, but like mm-hmm. quote unquote white kids, like me being Albanian yeah. Muslim, like someone would look at me and obviously I have a beard now, but when I was like in my teens and school, yeah, you had nothing. Yeah. Oh, you like clean cut, mm-hmm. we, you know, where are you from? Like you have to kind of like, so people naturally want to pigeonhole people and, and children learn from adults and all this other stuff. So I think, yeah, speaking for me and, and maybe speaking for you a little bit as well. It's like, when you have that experience, you automatically see through the matrix a little bit more. Yeah. That's what it was. And you're like, Oh, this is all ridiculous. Yeah. I want to, it's like, I never wanted to make any merit. Yeah, I never wanted to make anyone feel the way that I felt at certain times. And then like to know that like what I felt was a fraction of what some of these other kids that look completely different from me have had to deal with on an everyday basis. So I made sure that like when I started teaching that I never judged anyone based on anything more than like their character, you know? Um, But the thing is too, like going to Grady and then going to CUNY, It's like the United Nations, you're around like so many different people. So you get like a good judge of like character and culture. And, and, you know, you pick up all these like beautiful things about like the way people speak and like the way they interact with one another. And I remember I had a conversation with Mark Burnell, the CEO of uh, Lesser Known Comics. And um, he was talking to me about Sarita, who is Condry's like sidekick. And he was just like, you know, just in the future, just be careful. Like you're writing an African-American woman. And I was like, I am completely comfortable writing dialogue for an African-American woman. I'm like, I, I know, I know like three or four Saritas in my life. I am close to three or four Saritas, like that I could have a conversation with them. And like their Sarita is based off of people that have come into my, my life. I'm like, I will never, I'm like, I can promise you that no one will ever be offended by anything that Sarita says, you know, no one will ever say, oh, who's writing? Like, that's not the way like a, an African-American Listen, woman they, would sound. If they, look at, if they look at your profile picture and judge you based on that, then they don't know half the, half the picture. You yeah, should actually listen you know, to the artist dojo with <laughs> Patrick. Absolutely. On there. Yeah. Um, what I you would know, say so is just... interesting in, in, in writing I caught myself being a little like self-conscious about, Oh, what's, what would somebody think? And I immediately have to stop myself because it's like, no, right now I'm in the process of like taking the the paint bucket of these ideas and just going on the page. Yeah. Later I can slowly kind of, you know, mold it and make it better. But I, I I respect that, man. Like, you know, you, you gotta, you know what you know and you know what your intentions are. And I think, you know, as a, as a little side note, sometimes intentions can be lost in, in modern. We, we came up in Brooklyn, sure. I think, 90s, like that late 90s era was honestly maybe a little bit of a golden age. In, I agree. In what would be considered like cultural melting pot, you know, because mm-hmm. you everyone was around everyone. And yeah, you know that I think I, I'm, I'm very happy that I came up in that kind of middle space, like as social media was coming up, but still we had one hand in, you know, where you're able to like write stats on paper. Like if you were a generation or two ahead, it might've been a totally different ball game for you, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And it's so funny though, too, because it's like, I didn't come up with like all of this technology. Like I didn't have a computer until after high school. Like I used to type all of my papers on a typewriter and Mr. Mason, my history professor and Dorso, they would be like, what are you writing these on? And I'm like a typewriter. And they were like, you don't have a computer. Like, why don't you do it by hand? And I'm like, I hate writing by hand. So I would, I would type it. But at the same time, despite not growing up with all of that technology, I mean, I know Photoshop better than all of my students, you know, like 
I, I can use technology better than all of my students because I dedicated, I, I wasn't raised with it, but I, I made the connection. I focused myself on learning all of it. So it's like, it, we came, we came from a very special time, you know? What motivates you to keep going, man, to continue <sighs> kind of on the path that you're on? Cause I think you could, easily hang it up and say, Hey man, I wrote six books. I got a comic. Yeah. I got, you know, I'm a, I'm a professor, like, you know, all this other stuff, like wh what keeps you going on that path? I'm not even remotely close to like where I want to be. Um, I want to own a home. Um, I don't want my daughter or my son to have to pay for college. I don't want them to have to pay for their wedding, you know? Um, I want my wife to feel like she doesn't have to work. Like I'm far away from where I want to be. I'm getting there every day. Um, but I'm a long way away from like where I want to be. I want to, I want to have a nice house in Staten Island or New Jersey or something like that. You know, like, um, it's like Conjury comes from like a very, very close place to my heart because I feel like Brooklyn is like, a mess, you know, and it's just like, I don't want to like raise a family here anymore. Um, so it's just like, I want, it's two things. I want all of those things for my family, but then at the same time too, um, I want my kids to know that like their dad has done all of these things. So they, if they want to do them, they can do them too, that I'll show them how, you know, it's also too, even my students, like, there's so many professors like in every college, not just the colleges that I teach at that like haven't done anything. It's just like, I wrote on Facebook today. Um, a word that's over that's used like far too often is scholar. And it's like, you have somebody that just teaches. They just read a textbook to people and they call themselves a scholar. And a scholar is somebody that adds to the conversation, you know, and so it's just like, yeah, I consider myself a scholar. I'm wearing a PlayStation hat and I'm wearing a Randy Orton shirt, but I'm a scholar because I add to the conversation. I find out the things that like other people don't know. None of the stuff in my book is on like copied from Wikipedia. I don't take other people's research and um, quote it and put it in my books. I don't write to get promotions. I write to inform to educate and entertain like that's what a scholar is supposed to do so it's just like I do all these things for my family but then I do them for my students so this way if one of my students comes to me and goes you know and this happens all the time I want to be a voice actor what do I have to do and I'll be like listen my path was completely out there it's completely different from the average voice actor um this is what I did and I'll share the story oh professor I want to write a book how do I do that okay this is what I did Professor, I want to start my own site. Professor, I want to do this. I want to do that. So it's just like, I want to have those answers for them. I don't want to bullshit anybody. You know, I don't want to go, oh, you know, it's hard. Blah, blah, well, the, same thing I, I want happens, to be the same thing happens in the martial arts world where, you know, people have black belts and they think all of a sudden it's like the journey's over. It's like, no, that just yeah. means you're a serious student or an upperclassman. And you're, it's your responsibility if you take it to then usher in this next group. It's not to just like yep. root yourself in comfort and, hey, I yeah. got tenure and I'm, I'm good. Yep. You know, that, that yeah. there's like an epidemic of that. That's obviously a side conversation, but there's an epidemic of that <laughs> at, uh, academia, which even though I'm not in that world and I've actually actively avoided being in that world because mm -hmm. I, I, it would be hard. I'm a respectful guy, but it'd be very hard for me to hold my tongue in that environment. Oh, yeah. I'm sure it's yeah. difficult for you as well. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I know it's a little late. I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but I want to kind of rapid fire a couple of things and, and see. Yeah, let's do up. it. Um, I got time. I'm good. Um, okay, good. Yeah. I didn't want to, I know you, you know, you got stuff going on, but what would be kind of your, I guess your, uh, your, your Excalibur, like your, your, like if you had a project where you were like, Hey, this thing's getting done. My life is complete. <laughs> What do you think that would be? Is there something? No, no, there isn't. It's like, I, I'll tell you this much. Like um, after the minds buying the PlayStation 2 
uh, games. That's my seventh book that I'm working on right now. Actually, that's finished. I totally uh, want to do a book on professional wrestling. Um, that about I would be extremely pumped about. I, I've already spoken to about three dozen wrestlers about being featured. It would be very much like the minds behind the games, but like them telling me their stories on how they got into wrestling, all the things that they had to do in order to wrestle. Like I want it to kind of be like that book that like a young wrestler would read when they're thinking about like giving up or when they're thinking about getting into the industry. Like I would want, I would want it to be like the book that they read in the airport or on the bus, like going to like, you know, a show or something like Start that. Like that deep, deep chapter of uh catch wrestling yeah. into like the whole history of that. I'd be really excited yeah. to, to read that. man. I totally want to do that. I totally want to do a hockey book. Um, I definitely think Condry has legs. Um, I do I too, totally... by the way. I really, thank I, you. I finished issue one. Thank you for the thank you. signed issue zero. That's still in my like, nice CGC hard. Uh, like I have a, a box of books that I'm looking at right now that basically are like, these are going to be slabbed at some point. So it's nice. in my like hard uh, case over awesome. there. I told you, you you'll, you'll, you'll get comics from me for the, for the rest of your life. So so when one one is coming out um, in a couple of weeks in print, so you'll always have a nice, whenever nice you come color. to Brooklyn, you'll always have a comic. So, but um, I could totally see it as an animated series. I could totally see it as a film. Um, I told I, the thing is too with my connections in the video game industry, I've already spoken to developers, and I was like, listen, um, we should make we could make this a game, and they were like, yeah, absolutely. So it's just more about like the IP taking off and getting the respect that it deserves. So then this way it could branch out to other things. Cause it's like, I mean, you remember like the Sega Genesis games there, there, there are games out like Shikan. That was a comic book that like not a lot of people read and it became a really cool video game. Um, Turok, the dinosaur hunter, more people know the, know game, the game than the comic yeah. book. To, and to know? be perfectly honest, I didn't either. Like once I realized that I was like, Oh, that's, crazy how sometimes it translates differently yeah you know? shadow man great comic book but amazing game you know so it's just like i totally like i want to see how far i could take this ip but like there is there is no excalibur it's like my wife jokes around sometimes she'll be like oh when we when we retire and i'm just kind of like yeah that ain't happening <laughs> you that would work for like a week for you you would start itching on uh, day one <laughs> yeah and my wife knows too like when we're, when i'm on vacation the first week is usually fun, but like after that, it's just usually like a disaster because she's like, you need to go back to work. And I'm like, yeah, I know. I know. So there is no, there is no Excalibur. Like I just, I hope that like over the next 40, 50 years that I've just amassed like this massive, like library of, of finished work, you know, that's, that's, that's the Excalibur to have like a large body of work and not be able to be defined because there are people that still to this day they're like oh you write about video games right i'm like yeah but i do so much other stuff you know so it's just like i just want to when it's all said and done i want to just be put in a situation where i can't be pigeonholed or defined as like just one thing you know so what um how do you deal with failures mistakes regrets um move on from them as quickly as possible you know it's like um, it's like when I used to play hockey and I used to play baseball. If I struck out, I would just be like, all right, what did I do wrong? Let's try again, you know? Um, there's definitely been times like when I was at NBC where there would be like a typo in an article or something like that. And I'd be like, shit, you know? It happened. Let's go on to the next one. Let's make sure that I don't make the same mistake twice. That's why I try and pride myself on. So don't linger um, on it. Just kind of don't linger on it. It. It, ha it happened. How do we grow from it? How do we make sure that it never happens again? How do we kick ass tomorrow? You know, it's just like, cause oh, and people do this all the time. Like they, they make the same mistakes over and over and over again. They make these same mistakes with money. They make the same mistakes with their relationships. They make the same mistakes professionally. And it's just like, acknowledge it breathe it in understand what you did and then move on from it and then just make sure it doesn't happen again and if it happens again then you've got to take a closer look 
you know, and, and that's like, that's probably one of the things that I can that I can say that I, I don't think I've made the same mistake twice, like in terms of like writing and voice acting and teaching and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. I try and understand the mistakes that I make so I can grow from them and then move on and so, make another mistake, but a completely different one. So then conversely, how do you celebrate victories, accomplishments, good ideas? I'm terrible at celebrating like it's like after the first book came out, I felt like shit because it was like everything Why? that I wrote because I felt like everything that I wrote that was unique to me that like I was the only person in the world that knew it. Now it's wide open. So now I'm not unique anymore because I shared everything that I knew. So now I have to write another book and give more, you know? So it's just like, was it just cause it was scary to have this finalized product and you, you put yourself out there in a way. Was yeah, it easier in a way. to like have it internal? Like I'm trying yeah. to think of what, because I can only imagine like, let's say the comic I'm working on the day that I have that like printed version in my hand, did it feel different for Conjury for you than oh. it did for minds behind the games? Yeah. Conjury felt a lot different. Um, and the funny part was like um, the minds behind the shooter games came out probably like two weeks before Conjury zero came out. And I remember telling my wife, I was just like, I'm not as excited for this book. And she's just like, because you're so hyped for Conjury. <laughs> and the thing is, The Minds Behind the Shooter Games is the best book that I've done so far that's out. You know, it's the biggest book that I've done. It's got the best sources. Conjury was you know? bubbling for 20 years, though, man. So that's but, yeah. probably why. Yeah. So it's just like when Conjury came out, um, I remember I was just like, I wanted to cry, but I was just like holding it. And I was just like, oh, I'm not going to lie. When when we were at Bulletproof, you know, because I told you, I was like, hey, let's hang out. I I let you know, say, I was like, hey, man, I'm duly vaccinated. Let's go to Bulletproof and meet with Hank. And you were like, "Okay," you know, so uh, we we went and and you Hank was like, yeah, sign it. I'll put it in the thing. And you started to sign it and and you were trying to hold it back. But. I saw you were feeling you, you had some emotions bubbling. Man, it was, was heavy. Like? Yeah, it was heavy because it's just like I used to go in that store, you know, and and mind you, Bulletproof Comics for everyone who's listening is like this iconic comic book store in Flatbush, Brooklyn, right by the junction. It's been there since '92. It was like this safe, like even though there was gang violence back in the days, there it would be like this safe haven where nothing would happen in that space. So it it has very huge cultural significance with like comics and anime and, you know, Mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff, just so you have some context if you're listening. Sure. So it's like, I own over 3000 video games and I could easily say that like over like 200 of them were bought like either in Bulletproof one or the former, you know, Bulletproof two on, you know, Fort Hamilton and like 45th or something like that. So it's just like, I used to go on both Bulletproofs all the time, buy comics and stuff. I interviewed Hank when I was a student journalist at Brooklyn College. He was just always this like really chill, sage, you know, guy. And um, I was not expecting um, the praise that he gave me, you know? It just, it like completely like blew me away, but like at the same time empowered me. Like I cannot wait to go there for free comic book day and, and sign some shoot, comics and stuff like that. that dude, to see, to see you, man, I got to support because, uh, and anyone who's listening man. right now, uh, please go to lesser known comics.com. I believe is the, the website, correct. And you can mm-hmm. actually download, uh, Conjury zero Conjury number one, uh, free download. So, uh, I suggest that you, you absolutely do that because it's, it's only going to get bigger from here on out and you might as well check it out and, uh, there'll be a lot more info in the show notes, but I uh, just, I felt like I needed to say that. Yeah, man. So it was just like, it, it all like kind of came to a, to a head that day. It was just like, you know, when I told Hank the story and said like what dark horse and image that to us that they were just basically like, you know, we're not really like accepting anything new because of COVID and stuff. And he was just like, really? That's crazy. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, and then, he said it like they, like they missed, they missed a big opportunity basically, which yeah. I, I felt really good about that too for you. And that's the thing I tell people all the time. It's just like, I'm for my entire life. Like I have never been anyone's first choice for anything. 
and it doesn't hurt my feelings that, that I say that and I say it willingly and I say it openly and I say it 100% honestly, but I'm always their best choice. And I'm always the type of person that like, um, when I'm out of your life, you know, when I'm in your life, sometimes you take me for granted because I'm consistent. I'm consistently consistent, <laughs> you know, um, and I'm not a competitive person. I'm the most competitive person, you know, and um, it's just easy to kind of like have somebody like that and take them for, for granted, you know, and it's just like, I remember telling Kieran when we were pitching it and then COVID happened and stuff and he didn't hear from me for like a couple months and I would message him and I'm like, listen, I am still actively pitching this. Like, do not give up on this. Like, be ready, be ready. And he's like, no, I am, I am, I am. And then when, you know, the whole thing with lesser known comics happened, I was like, did you ever think that this wasn't going to happen? And he's like, no, he's like, I, he's like, I got it. He's like, I trusted you. And I'm just like, and that's one of the reasons that's why we get along so well. Person to have on your team, someone that, that yeah. leaves from the jump, you know? Yeah. But to, to answer your question, like that day was just like, it's very rare that I get any type of like, um, positive reinforcement for the stuff that I do because it's just like people don't willingly say oh you know your books touched my life or like oh like I'll see reviews on Amazon and stuff like that or somebody will message me and like want to talk to me on Instagram and I'm super nice and I love talking to people but it's very rare that somebody will go what you're doing is like really important you know it's like so when I get it it like really hits hard and it's like I've had video game developers tell me like Benjamin Johnson and Tony Barnes, was, they're like two of like the best game developers I've ever met. They've worked on like tons of great stuff. And they're like, you're doing the Lord's work. Like they're like, you're doing great work. So it's just like that really like makes me feel great about like what I'm doing. But like to get it from, because I mean, you know this, like Hank does not mince words. Um, I've seen it, him. I've seen him roast people to their face. Yeah. And it's not like he's not being a bad person about it. He doesn't mean he's it. Like, so to be mean. honest because he's been in the game for so long. He's read so many books that yep. he'll, he'll just, it's this like very honest expression. And uh, yeah, that's why I'm kind of like laughing about it because when he, when he looked at your book and then he also looked at the art, he looked at me like, he's like, yeah, this is, this is the real deal. Yeah. So it was just like, just to get that. <sighs> It was just like, um, it was like that mm, moment, like that moment, like in your head where you're just like, somebody else knows, somebody else gets it, you know? And those are so rare. Like, gives being you a little a creator extra juice to kind of extra. Going. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just like, cause like being a creator is like, it's, it's like a lonely, it's a lonely, hard road, you know? So it's just like when you get those moments, like that I totally took in, you know? And then it was just like a couple of days later, he wrote something super nice on Instagram. And then I popped into his live and he said something nice. And it was just like, like, this is going to work. Like we're going to be able to, to do this. And it's just like, um, I think it definitely like affected like the next couple of scripts that I submitted because I wanted them to be even better than they were. And I made some tweaks and tightened and things like that. And it's just like, I told Kieran too, I'm like, cause Kieran's from Buffalo. Um, oh, that's crazy. I'm up yeah. in Buffalo now. So that's funny how that's like crazy. Now he's in know. Williamsburg. Yeah. Um, but I told him like to get praise from this guy. I'm like, it's totally like, we're totally going down the right path. And we've gotten some great reviews. We have not gotten one bad review yet. I'm waiting on it. It's going to happen one day, you know, Statistically, um, man, what are you going to do? You know? Yeah. Just, you know, it is what it but is. I know, I know that like we're headed down the right path, you know? And it's like, um, I don't, I'm going to do whatever I have to do to make sure that this journey like continues. So, um, do you, I feel like I might have some, insight into this question but i want to ask you anyway mm -hmm. uh sure. do you have uh, daily habits or rituals and if so what are they coffee in the morning <laughs> what's she gonna <sighs> say dude you i'm a nasty bastard for, for duncan man <laughs> i'm a nasty bastard if i don't get coffee in the morning like i i'm like a like the snickers commercial you know like i'm a different person like i need some type of coffee in the morning like 
that little juice. Um, what other rituals? Um, so like I have on my computer, I have like the sticky notes and I have to like make sure that like even on a terrible day, on a terrible day, I've got to be able to cross off at least one thing. Like I need to have every day, even Saturday and Sunday, I need to do at least one thing off of that list, you know, because I mean, it's being repopulated every day. So it's just like, if I take three things off, I'm going to add five more things and stuff like that. So it's just like, I have one to thing get off something. the list a day. At least one thing, you know, like I have to work towards the things like today. Um, my wife took my daughter to um, g- uh, gymnastics and I got to work on my book for maybe like 25 minutes, but it was 25 minutes, you know, even if it was one minute, as long as I keep the wheels moving in, in that direction, even a little bit, even if the wheels just turn around one time, it's different from other people because some people go, oh, it's the weekend. I'm not going to do anything. So just me turning the wheels over once is more than what the average person is doing. So it's just like, I'm going to wake up earlier than the average person. I'm going to go to bed later than the average person. And it's like, um, I remember the day that I had weight loss surgery, I'm in the hospital and they're making me walk because like your body is like filled with gas from the surgery and stuff like that. And like, they were like, oh, you can lay down now. And I'm like, nope. And I kept walking and walking and walking. And then when I finally laid down, I was in like so much pain, but I had my phone and I started writing, you know? And um, it was like a Monday night or something like that. And I was watching like Monday Night Raw on my phone and writing up the article for my site the next day, like literally like four hours after surgery, because I knew I had to get that done that day. And my wife was like, you're crazy. You could just give it to somebody else to write, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, nope. So it's just like every day got to get at least one thing done, you know, Um yeah, that's that's probably the worst thing about me, but the best thing about me at the no, same time. No, I think that's honestly so. amazing, an amazing piece of advice for anybody is like, if you are a list maker or you have things that you know you have to do in that day, I think, you know, that one thing could be huge, that one thing could be small, but it's it's a victory for yeah. the day, and I think that's that's actually gigantic if you think about it because yeah. there's some days I know for me I've gone to bed and felt like the day's a wash because I've only done little little bits of multiple things versus saying like, Hey, I completed this. That's a victory for the day on to the next. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's uh, so like coffee that (laughs) that's pretty much, I live like a a smile on your face though, when you're holding the coffee. So that's how I know you, you, you're hooked (laughs) today. I was like, so cranky. I wanted to get out of the house like really bad. I was just bored and um, I ended up walking and meeting a friend. We went to GameStop and then we went to Brooklyn video games and I got a couple of game gear games. I spent like $4 in the video game store. Um, But I had the iced coffee and it was just like, Oh, I could feel it. You know, like I was just like, I needed, I needed my coffee and it just, it kind of like changed. It changed the, it changed the day, you know, like it just gave me like that. I can't even explain it, you know? So it's like, I've gone, like, I remember after I had weight loss surgery, I didn't drink coffee for like a year, you know, I just quit it completely. And then I got down to like, pretty much like my goal weight. And I was like, I could start drinking coffee again. And, um, and I started again and I don't think I'll ever stop drinking coffee again. <laughs> you know, I've toned down cause I used to drink like two or three large iced coffees like a day. You know, sometimes I would just be like, oh, I'll mix protein in with it and it'll be a meal. Yeah, yeah. You know? That's your that's the that's the brain trying to find a way. You're like, hey man, yeah. get my coffee in. <laughs> yeah. But I don't do that anymore. So I usually just have like one in the morning. So I'm a lot, it's a lot better than it was before. But yeah, that's that's pretty much like my only like ritual or or like habit, you know. Cool. I uh I'll kind of end with this. I just want to say that like, uh, I think you know this already, but I'll say it again. I have a a deep amount of respect for you because thank you. the work that you do is also connected. I think not just for me, but for a lot of people to these parts of our lives that maybe kind of get um, like shooed away by other people. Like, you know, a love for, love for video games or love for stories or, 
you know, I, I my route took me into the storytelling slash acting route. Mm -hmm. But it could have very yeah. easily gone in the direction of like, oh, hey, I want to work in video games. But, you know, we find ourselves here now. So when I see your work, I just think to myself, I was like, man, I really respect that. I see someone who is doing the thing they're passionate about, not only doing it, actively contributing to that world, completing work, and also seemingly having fun while doing it in a, you know, serious way. So um, I respect that if, you know, a lot Thank of people you. don't say it to you, or maybe they're scared to say it because, you know, they don't maybe perform on that same level. I see it. I respect it. And, uh, I just wanted to openly say that to you. So um, you, if there's man. anything that you want to kind of share with whoever's listening ways that they can check out the stuff that you're doing, you know, let them, let them know now. And I'll also share it in the show notes. Yeah. I mean, I'm totally like, I'm Google verified, even though Google, like, List me as an actor for some reason. It's so weird. Like if you Google my name, well, it says well, actor. Here's why. Because of the awesome work on the Padre. Probably. You know? It's so here. which is cool. Hit, hit, him, hit him with a little bit of it so they know what Hello, you're talking about. Ephraim. My name is Alexander and I am the Padre. You know? Um <laughs> that was so much like that whole like, I mean, we're talking that was three years of my life, those two games you know, and talking to like a team of like eight guys in Bulgaria every day for three years. And like, I was talking to the creator yesterday for a little while and like, uh, we were just bullshitting and, but it was just like, cause now I'm on teams for like, you know, four or five other games. So it's just like, and I don't think, I don't think they're going to come out with another Padre. I don't know. I don't know. But, um, it was just like, that was such a huge, huge part of my life. It was so much fun, but it just like, um, if you want to find out more, they can just go to patrickhickeyjr.com. Um, that has pretty much like all of my stuff. Instagram is like my preferred um, social media platform. Facebook is more like family um, and, and fun. But like Instagram is just like complete like train of thought. Like if I think of a game, if it pops up into my head, if I think you, of a comic I don't book know, cover. I don't know another person who... Like for a for a while, I thought like you pre-populated the posts on a bot or something. Cause I was like, how? Yeah, no. How? <laughs> Some people think that I do, you know. But it's I know like, you I don't can't. because I know you. But if I didn't know you and I looked, I was like, yo, it's like a literal stream of conscious. It's like, yeah. oh, this game. I like, what do you think about this game? What do you think about this actor? What do you think? It's like, yeah. oh, you know? Yeah, because it's like when I uh every day before I go to bed, I like make I try and get like anywhere from like 30 to like 40 pictures of like, um, I always do like two or three wrestlers. I do like an actor. Like, I think today was like Tina Fey. Cause I was watching 30 rock and I was I love Tina Fey. Oh, I'd have her babies. Um, but, um, and then it's just like, you. <laughs> yeah, well, she knows, she knows. And it's like, it's so funny. Cause like when I used to work at NBC, I worked in 30 rock and then I would come home and my wife would always wait for me to come home she's fucking awesome and 30 rock would be on and it would just be like oh my god i just like i just got out of here you know but um so it's like i find some wrestlers that i, I think i want to talk about and I, I i look through i'm looking through comic book panels and covers all day so whenever i see something i just save it to my phone and then whenever a game pops up into my head i'll just save it on my phone and then i'll just wait for the moment that i want to post it and that, that picture could be on my phone for like two weeks or it could be just on there for a day, like when I'm like planning like the next day and stuff like that. But then it's just like, as the day goes on every like, you know, hour, hour and a half, two hours or whatever. I'm just like, Oh, what do I want to throw up? Oh, remember this? Oh, wipe out on PS one. Oh, Ridge racer on PS one, you know, or like, you know, or any sort of like thing. Or then like, if I'm playing games and I record videos, I save the videos on my phone and I hold on to them. And then like, I post them when I want to. So like, yeah, I post a ton on Instagram, but it's just like, um, it's, it's, it's kind of like an extension of me. My mind is just going in a thousand different directions all day. Like can't stop, won't stop, eh, 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 you know? So Instagram is probably like the best place to like talk to me. Who plays you in the like biopic of the so, thing, um, in your movie? Wyatt Russell. I feel like you had thought about that at some point. I have. I have. Absolutely. <laughs> I like uh, Captain, uh, not Captain America, uh, Falcon Winter Soldier was so good. I thought it was so underrated. Um, I think Wyatt Russell did an awesome job as John Walker. Oh, yeah. 
And I'm just like, that's that guy could play me. He, he was play fantastic me in, a heartbeat. in that. He was fantastic in um, Black Mirror, the episode that he mm-hmm. was in Black Mirror. Yeah. I wish I looked like Charlie Hunnam and Charlie Hunnam could play me or Chris Hemsworth. I'm probably like the same like height as Chris, Chris Hemsworth, but he's all like, you know, he's, he's I can't think of his name, Ryan Hurst. Ryan Hurst. Wow. Yeah. 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 Ryan Hurst. Mm hmm. So, but like with, with like a, a geeky sensibility. So it's just like if like Adam Sandler and like Wyatt Russell could have a child, it would be like a cross between those two, you know, because you'd, have, you'd to have to do them, voices. You'd have to infuse them with iced coffee. Mm-hmm. It'd be like an episode of Rick and Morty where like Rick <laughs> is just like taking like the DNA of Duncan and then the DNA of those two actors and just like mixing them together. So that would be awesome. Uh, again, that's my, do you hear Pinky yawning just now? <laughs> She's yawning at the door like, hey, my, my dog's sleeping right I'm, here. I'm hungry. She like eats, you know, at a certain time. So when, when it's not oh, yeah. on her natural clock, she's like, hey, something's up. They train you too. I, I'm yeah, a firm sure. believer in that. Brother, thank you again. I really appreciate it. I hope you'll be yeah, no problem. first, uh, second time guest down the line at some point. Because there's, I mean, listen, to, to try to put you and your work and your story in a nutshell is not going to happen. So oh, yeah. We can totally. only thank have, you for have multiple talks down the line. And uh, absolutely. Yeah. If anything, like I said, man, you know, call me anytime. That's an honest sure. extension. Thanks, you know, man. To you, so. No, I know it is. I know it is. And like, I just want to say to like, out of all the people that I've met and like all the people that say that they want to do stuff like you are, you're in a completely different stratosphere, you know, like you, you do the things that you say, you know, you're a man of your, your word. You know, so very few, very, very few people like you. So like you're a good guy, like you're, you're going to do it. You know, you're doing it right now. So it's like, when you asked me to come on the show, I was like, absolutely. You know? So it's just like, I turned down podcasts, you know? So it's just like, when you were like, oh, you want to come on? I'm like, yeah, yeah, let's do this. So thanks, brother. thank you for, I, I, thank you I for having me. It, man. No, dude. Yeah, no problem. Know, it's uh, it's my honor to, to have you on and, uh, We'll talk again and we'll hang out and hopefully I'm down in Brooklyn for free comic book day and I get Hell to yeah. here in as well. And oh, yeah, we'll, yeah, yeah. we'll shout that out some more down the line. All right, brother. Peace. Absolutely. Have a good night. And uh, thanks. No problem, for man. Bye. No problem, dude. Have a good one. Take care.